I'm coping great. I'm feeling positive about life, and I just have a clearer outlook on things. I, I think medication has saved my life. Depression is one of the commonest medical disorders in our society. There is approximately a 15% chance for men before they die to suffer from depression. For women, it's higher. 20 out of 100 will suffer from depression before they die. We know that about 60% of people who actually suffer from depression never seek treatment. So why is this? Well, one factor may be that we have a tendency to deny that the disorder is present. We also feel shame that what are people going to think of me? How do I think of myself if I actually go and get help? And maybe if I just stick it out and try harder, it'll all go away. I, I think my mother suffered periodic bouts of depression, but it was never diagnosed. Uh, you know, my family, of course, is from a time and an age when uh, depression was considered somehow or other uh, evil or uh, you, know, you were tainted. From what I had read, uh, going through a serious illness, it is very normal to, to get depressed afterwards. I never thought it would happen to me. Depression is often misunderstood. Many believe it to be a weakness of character. This is false. For me, the medication had always been something that was a weakness. Like a diabetic who has to take their insulin to control their disorder, then the depressed individual takes their medication. We don't make the diabetic feel guilty because they're sticking a needle into their arm and say terrible things about them, that they're like a drug addict who's out on the street. Why should we do that for the depressed person? Make them feel guilty about it. They've got a real medical disorder that deserves the same respect and treatment options as the diabetic or the hypertensive. And I just realized that after 20 years of being in therapy, there wasn't anything I hadn't talked about, you know? It was like, what am I doing here? And he said, you know, it's very silly because if you were a diabetic, you'd have no qualms about taking insulin. You'd be crazy not to. If you had heart disease, if you had any other kind of physical ailment, you'd go to your doctor, the doctor would give you a prescription, you'd take it and be happy that it was there. Why the prejudice against this? And um, I had to say to him, I don't know why. Another important myth about depression is the fact that I've got good reason to be depressed. So, for example, the cancer patient who has suffered the devastation of chemotherapy or the change in body image, or the individual who's had a heart attack and now their lifestyle has changed, they look at it themselves and they say, well, who wouldn't feel like that? Who wouldn't feel depressed in this situation? And, you know, unfortunately, many people deny themselves treatment because of that line of reasoning. Just because there's a good reason to be depressed, it doesn't mean that you should be denied treatment. It's like saying that the person has a stressful lifestyle and so therefore there's good reason to have high blood pressure. Therefore we won't treat them for their high blood pressure. We don't use that. So the same applies. If you fulfill all the symptoms of depression, then you deserve and it's appropriate to get the help. Through the whole illness, I, I always felt that um, talking about it was was good. You know, I, I never felt that I should hide anything, and it was very, uh, very beneficial for me to talk about it with friends. Kids, too. Eh? And the kids, kids involved. Yeah, huh? yeah. Depression was a little bit different. I, I did feel that it was a little bit more, um, not maybe, I don't know, not as socially accepted, that sort of thing. Um, but actually, <laughs> there's a lot of people that are depressed, and through talking with them, there's a lot of people that are anti antidepressants, but I don't think it's widely talked about. It's not something you come out and tell the ladies in the schoolyard. The heart attack, well, yeah, after the heart attack, the uh, I went into a very blue period. Talk about having a, you know, the impact of depression on a second heart attack. Yeah, I believe it's so. You know, I can I can understand that because uh, you begin to feel so badly about yourself and so poorly in terms of your own 
you know, self-image, self-confidence, self-esteem, whatever it is that I think that, uh, you know, emotional factors, uh, you know, can just play an enormous uh, role in, uh, you know, one's physical health, and uh, the heart attack would be a classic one. Clinical depression is a medical disorder, and it's characterized by sadness, decreased interest, and a loss of enjoyment in one's life. The change in your sleep pattern in which you may have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. When you wake up in the morning, you feel tired rather than rested. Then your energy is low during the daytime and you feel fatigued. There may be changes in your appetite, either a decreased appetite or an increased appetite. And with the increase, we often see a cravings for sweets and chocolates and carbohydrates. You may notice that your concentration is off. You're more indecisive. There are feelings of guilt and self-blame. What's wrong with me? Why am I this way? It may actually get to the point that the worthlessness makes you think that maybe life isn't worth it. The sexual desire goes down. There's more worry and you stew over things also. So when you have at least five of these symptoms that I've just mentioned, and it's persistent day after day for two weeks or longer, then you've got to think of depression. Uh, I would sit out here on the back deck and watch my flowers die by the day, but to go down the steps and take out the watering can and water the plants, it was too much. I couldn't grocery shop. I guess the big the big day was when uh, I woke up one morning and I said, I can't even look after Matthew. Then I really knew that I needed, uh, kind of needed some help. <laughs> what made me decide to go ahead was the fact that I couldn't get any worse than I was. Um, I felt like I was at the bottom, and any anything I tried would be, you know, a step in the right direction. There are certain markers for depression that are important to identify, and that can help you understand whether your treatment's working. At about one month, I'd expect my patient to be 50% better. At about two months, you should be 75% of yourself. There's another interesting phenomenon that everybody should be aware of. At the end of the second week or the beginning of the third week, an individual often feels worse. This is part of the normal process when an individual is taking antidepressants, so it's something that passes after three to five days. But you should be aware of it. She did warn me that uh, it would be about four weeks for it to kick in. And it, it was, it took about close to six weeks before I started feeling better. And sort of brightened up, you know, mm-hmm. sort of the, it's like the clouds mm-hmm. clearing away and the sun coming out again. Yeah, you know? and it wasn't, uh, wasn't something that happened overnight. I didn't wake up one day and said, wow, it's working. You know, it was kind of a gradual thing. Mm-hmm. Kind of went through a week and said, you know, at the end of the week I said, wow, you know, I had a good week. You know, I felt good this week. And then, it kind of, then I realized that it must be the medication starting to work. Once I realized, about six weeks after I started taking it, I, I started feeling really quite good. I had, a, I had a part of myself back that I hadn't had for years. We often have to change our medication or treatment midstream. Some of the reasons for this could be a partial response, not being able to tolerate the side effects, or there are interactions with other medications because of other illnesses that are present. If you're experiencing side effects that are of concern to you, you should talk to your doctor about this. There are options available in other antidepressants that can help. Not all antidepressants are the same. Depression is like being in a fog. You can't see clearly, you know, you can't see. And the medication and also his therapy has helped me clear up that fog. I can see a future, you know, I could see a good future for myself and uh, just overall feeling better about myself in general. I feel a lot more confidence about the treatment that she's taking now that I've seen the change where it's like she's a totally new person, kind of like the person I remember when we were growing up. So it's like really positive. I'm okay with the medication. I know it's not harming her in any way. It's more helping her. So um, I'm good with that. It's very important to know how to actually stop your antidepressant. Doing it cold turkey is not the way to do it. The reason for it 
is that there's an entity referred to as discontinuation syndrome, which is a flu-like illness which can be very disconcerting for the patient. The medicine should always be re-evaluated on a yearly basis, even though indefinite treatment may be indicated. Besides the medication, I've become very involved in yoga, and I have never, ever been a flexible person, but I have to say at 50, I can stand on my head now, and that's big, and that's fun. I get up early. I enjoy getting up early. And that, to me, seems to be the sign of good health. And I just wish I'd done it earlier. I just wish I, you know, the drugs themselves are different now maybe than they were 20 years ago. But um, I wish that I had allowed myself to try these out earlier. I think it would have helped a lot throughout my adult life. Uh, Hopefully your your family doctor will recognize uh, the signs as well um, and stick with your medicine. Uh, It does take a while for it to kick in, but once it starts working, it does wonders.